Thank you, Simon, for the very, very kind intro. My wife would not agree with your assessment of me as humble. Um, so this talk, um, what I want to convince you to do, uh, whether you're a line manager, CTO, middle manager in the middle, is to make some time in your day, every day, to systematically review the pull requests within your team. And so hopefully I can make that case to you. Um, this, this is my opinion based on my experience running those teams. They're pretty successful teams, so I just feel like I should add a disclaimer that the standard survivor bias and halo effect and other um, you know, general issues with people generalizing advice from their own experience apply. Uh, it should be attached to every conference talk ever. Um, people I used to work with are in the audience, and they'll notice that the reality of events is not as neat and tidy as I put them in these slides. Um, does everyone know who this is? Yeah, Andy Grove. So former CEO of Intel. Um, he wrote a book. I'm a book guy. Uh, the title of this talk, Code Review, is the manager's job, is a play on the title of a chapter in his book. The book is High Output Management. It's kind of, as far as I'm considered, the Bible on managing engineering organizations. Um, the title is Training is the Manager's Job. And his argument is that, as a manager, you know, your responsibility is, or you're responsible for the output of your organization. And as a manager, you have two levers to pull to increase that output, which is the motivation of the people in your team and the capabilities of the people in your team. There is a ceiling on motivation. There is no ceiling on capability. And so by engaging, by making time to engage with the task of training your team, is you have this kind of almost unlimited upside, um, continuous improvement opportunity. Um, also, by engaging with the training, you engage with the work that your team actually do and you understand them better. You, you get better connected to the work the line staff is doing. And so I believe that um, engaging with the pull request process um, is a similar high leverage activity um, and that you should do it. Uh, this is not a talk advocating for doing code review because 2006 called and it wants its thought leadership back. <laughs> if you're not doing it, um, there's a good blog post. It's 12 years old now. Um, and I'm not going to talk really specifically about how to do a good code review because I think fundamentally a lot of that is, is an engineering task. It's um, you know, a skill and responsibility of the people in your team, not so much your skill. I want to talk about kind of get a bit more meta about the process. That's the code review review, is I think that you should be spending your time reviewing the review process and then applying changes to it. Um, late last year, uh, this guy, Brian Guthrie, had never heard of him before, uh, but he posted a really good Twitter thread uh, in which he kind of discusses that uh, GitHub has had this fundamental change in how we do our work. That, um, that we have this new kind of asynchronous, open source centric model of development. Um, and that is, it's tooling that is great, you know, really good for developing open source software. And it's had a kind of a viral effect in changing corporate practice. And that some of those changes have been you know, net positive, And some of them actually can be problematic. And then beyond that as well, is there are just, there are differences between an open source community and a corporate environment. And like he lists a couple down the bottom here, which is that in a paid team, you know, in an open source situation, there are volunteers, you've no control of when they arrive, when they leave. Um, we have a process for you know, bringing people into a team, taking them out again. Um, another thing that's missing from open source is there are no managers. You know, it, it's like a pure volunteer self-organizing structure. And so GitHub also went you know, pretty mind-blowingly uh, meta into their own open source culture, which is they didn't really believe in managers. They thought they could get away without having them. And uh, if people remember a few years ago is that they descended into a bit of a chaotic shitstorm of HR and PR disasters. Um, and there's this essay from the 70s from the feminist movement called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which kind of lays out um, kind of the challenges that can happen with implicit power structures developing. You know, the, you, in theory, you're in this utopia of perfect transparency and egalitarian volunteerism, but that 
negative outcomes can develop from those, uh, those implicit power structures. I really recommend you read this. Um, I've referenced a lot of books and articles in the talk, and I'll tweet out links to all of them at the end. So there's another couple of really good recent posts um, kind of on that same topic, which is that um, your culture is what you reward and punish, um, both explicitly and implicitly. And so one of these posts talks about an exercise you take some managers, partners, like, what's the advice you give to someone that's just been hired? Like, how do I get ahead in this organization? And they start by telling cute stories about put the customer first and um, be agile. And then they get into the actual truth, which is like be always available on email or you know, always um, prioritize BAU work over new customer. No, it's the other way around. But or, always fix tech debt. That'll tell you get ahead. Um, and so one thing, it kind of linking you know, that idea that within the organization there are these... Um, these kind of implicit under the waterline incentives going on in, you know, in these utopian transparent environments um, is that if, if you're not present in that space as a manager, these power structures and these incentives are going to develop anyway. And this, this is a, a great risk, but it also presents a great opportunity because if the incentives and the social reinforcement that happens within your code review process is apart from the overall company values, then the company is not going to do very well. You know, these things will drift apart. But if you can harmonize those incentives so that the, um, the strategic alignment of the company and the values is reinforced from planning sessions down to you know, the very fine line-by-line -line comments people leave on code, is that you can start you know, really transforming your organization through the, that kind of power of harmony, um, which is something the Healthy Organizational Incentives is a great post on kind of stitching together those explicit and implicit incentives. Um, are there any like lean software fans in the room that know all the buzzwords? Not many, great. Here's a word from lean, it's Genba. It roughly translates to the place. It's an idea within lean management that as a manager to have any kind of clue about what the hell is going on in your organization is you have to go to the place where they do the work. And so if you're a distributed team or if you're using one of these online asynchronous code review places, like that is where the work happens. And so if you've decided that um, this is a technical space, I don't belong here, I don't participate, then you really do not actually have any clue about what's happening in the organization. The Gemba is paired with this other, commonly paired with another practice in Lean, which is called leader standard work, which is these ritualized cycles of activities that you do either every day, every week, every month, that are kind of non-negotiable in what should a leader within an org do, and the Gemba walk is one of those. So often, as a, you know, a team lead, you will, it's part of the expectation that every day you will walk to the factory floor and you will like, look at stuff, have conversations with people doing the work. You kind of participate and engage with the real work of the organization, not just sit in budget meetings all day, every day. And so that's kind of what I'm advocating for you all to, to build is that leader standard Gemba walk, which is take some time every day or week as makes sense for you, go and look at the workplace um, and where that workplace exists online. And you should do it systematically so that you don't end up like this guy. Like, I don't take etiquette advice on group chats from my parents, and if you've gone full post-technical and you decide to walk into a pull request and tell everyone what's what, uh, that's not gonna go very well either. I think uh, an important thing about managing teams as more and more work has been pushed online is that new social norms of behavior are developing. Now, GitHub's now an old example, but I think Slack's a really good, more current example, is that there are political moves and uh, there's subtext in organizational communications that are transmitting your culture, and that if you are not engaging in the tools and learning the idioms of those platforms, then 
you, you're losing an avenue to kind of regulate culture and that's kind of what you need to do if you want to drive a change through an organization, you need to change the culture first. I think this is where it's important as well to be systematic. You might think, I do read lots of PRs because whenever there's uh, a disaster, it crosses my desk and so I go and look at it. The problem with using that kind of interrupt-driven, I'm going to go look at something broken philosophy is it doesn't help you develop an intuitive understanding of, of like what good work looks like. You only know what things look like when they're bad. It also might mean that you don't know what half of the organization who don't screw up, what their idioms look like. You only know the idioms of the screw up team. And so you need to make, make the time to not just respond to disasters, but to engage positively with every team and every group and every individual in your org and how they do their work, how they talk about their work. Uh, I was brought up in the kind of Australian bogan tradition of spending many weekends in paddocks with hot rods with this sign in the window. So as I was looking for the right slide, I had a bit of a flashback here. Um, this is, I think, the one thing you can screw up a lot. If you do build this habit of, I'm going to go look at all the work, um, well, we have a word for managers that look at everything and then leave a comment on everything, and that word is micromanagement. So one thing you need to do is fight your own instincts to, um, to manipulate every pull request. The, this is where I think it's, it's really helpful to delineate the idea that the review of the code is the team's job because they're on the critical path. Uh, they're the experts in that work. And so they're the ones that should have something to say on every bit of code. You know, that comes through. Whereas you as the manager, you're there more to, um, to learn, to take uh, impressions in, and then also kind of take advantage of, of your own emotional distance. Because if you're not caught up in their daily loop, then you can keep an eye out for trends, to, to look at things uh, from a different perspective. I think that one of the management superpowers is as a developer, you're very much driven stand up to stand up, sprint to sprint, PR to PR. You're in a kind of a days, weeks cycle. Managers, we're either interrupt driven or we're long strategic thought driven. And so it's by being able to either respond to things immediately or to think deeply out of cycle that can give us a good perspective and have something useful to say about these PRs. So the problem, though, with all this looking and not touching is what, what do I do? How do I fight my own kind of cognitive biases like the recency bias and just like overplay what did I see yesterday? And the thing, the thing that's worked for me is to keep a diary. I first started one 10 years ago uh, managing the Envato team, which was every week I would create a markdown file and I would copy and paste in the links to pull requests that I thought were particularly good or particularly bad. Um, it, it would then, then I would loop that with a bigger cycle of once a week I would go and review that list and it would provide me um, the idea, the, it would give me the idea of like what do I want to talk about in retro this week or is there a, like a, an underlying theme of something I need to address in someone's one to one, is there a team issue, an individual issue, uh, when it's annual review time I can kind of look and go, I want to look back through my diary for what did everything that this team member do so that I'm not just overreacting to what I last saw of that team or person. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. Um, I think Casey's definition uh, for high-performing teams of you know it when you see it. Like, I don't think you need to overcomplicate, you know, what you're tracking in this diary. Like, you know what good work is. You were promoted for a reason, probably because there's some property in what you think about how to develop software, you know, hopefully you're not in charge of that team by accident. Um, but if you do want some kind of framework um, for how to think and what to maybe record is like all genuine thought leadership, I have a two by two for you. I've got a couple of axes, uh, that's a key part. Um, up and down, the technical outcome. You can think of this as like, what's the quality of the diff tab on GitHub? And horizontally, that's the word. 
the process and collaboration is everything on the comments tab. Now there's a checks tab, so maybe I need to make the, uh, this a three-dimensional two by two by two. I'm post-technical, don't ask. Um, I'm also really bad at uh, naming things, so I, I chose albums I liked of the late 90s and early 2000s. <laughs> so just to um, give you a, an overview of the territory, uh, let's go clockwise. What are rock stars doing today? This is a good or great technical outcome with a terrible process. Um, where the collaboration wasn't what you hoped for or um, you know, something's gone wrong process-wise. Um, gold is easy, everything is A-OK. -okay. Um, classic Ryan Allen Adams album. Uh, Comfort Eagle is where you're really happy with the process, but the results just aren't coming. Like the, the quality of outcome isn't that great, but you know, things are looking good process-wise. Endowed Spiral. You know, another easy to understand one, nothing's working. The outcome was bad and the process was bad. So let's take the easiest one first. Everything's broken. Um, the, I actually kind of really like situations where everything is broken because literally almost anything will work. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you work with great quality people, so it's actually kind of rare to hit this kind of classic dysfunction. Um, but I would suggest that maybe if you are looking at your team's work and you're seeing things are trending in this bottom corner, is that it's probably not actually a problem with the actual code review process itself. The team probably knows everything they need to do to get out of that corner. It might be a resourcing issue. It could be, you know, we're not getting the opportunity to prioritize, you know, a change in workflow a change in process to then achieve the higher outcome. I think nearly all paths out of the bottom left go through good process, bad outcome. You know, I don't think you can just go straight up to like, a, we've changed the process and now everything is good now. It's, you know, there are paths through this space. The next most problematic quadrant is what are rock stars doing today? Uh, you chose this classic Geelong uh, rock album because one cause, one of many potential reasons for why you're in this corner is, you know, the ninja rock star brilliant jerk problem, which is that you have an engineer that is creating these great technical artifacts, but their collaboration stinks. Um, like, that's, that's a distinct problem and one you should work on. Another reason you could be in this corner is you're just lucky. You know, sometimes good things can happen despite bad process. Um, the, I did have a third thing that it could be. I, use your imagination, I forgot. Um, coming back to, you know, as we discussed earlier, uh, sorry, as Casey discussed about diversity and inclusion, is um, this guy, Lieutenant General David Morrison, uh, was kind of spearheading improving the inclusion <laughs> of the Australian Army, and I figure if someone can try and make the government department of Shooty Killy more inclusive, then I can probably do something to make the department of Thinky Typey a bit more <laughs> inclusive. So in his talk, there's, there's a line, and in, in this is him, uh, some terrible sexist behavior in the Army happens, and he rips everyone a new asshole. And he has this line, um, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And I think as managers with responsibility for inclusion in your org, is there's two ideas I really want to unpack in that. The first is um, that when you see behavior that is not okay, it, you, the moral imperative is to act. And I think one thing that has not quite flowed through management thought yet as we've pushed more and more interaction online is the adage of praise in public, criticize in private. And I don't think this works very well in PRs or in Slack because the hurtful comment lives in kind of the company's permanent record forever, but the corrective behavior is private and transitory. And there are many, many situations in a company's lifetime when you go back to look at the record and look, you know, why was this particular technical discussion 
go this way. And you might discover that someone said something very hurtful to someone else, and there was no consequence that you could see. And so I think it's very important where you have these transparent, permanent record type tools is that you proportionately match transgressions with public corrective behavior. It might even be just to say, hey, so-and-so, we're going to have a talk about this privately. But you need to make sure that everyone can see that your organization is doing things to, to, to manage that behavior. Um, the comfort eagle corner, um, where the process is good, but the outcome isn't. Um, this, I think, is probably a pretty common corner to be in because your own expectations of what is a good outcome and a good process can change over time. It's also the, the corner that you will pass through going from the downward spiral to gold. Um, the, and sometimes it can just be bad luck. This is what, another reason why I think you should look at trends is like if, any, if you would say this PR had a bad outcome but the process is fine, leave it. It's only when you start accumulating a bunch of negative outcomes with, a good, with what you think is a good process um, that there's a problem. And there might not be a problem, is that maybe your own idea of what a good process is needs to change. Um, and the other thing is that you could have hit a scaling limit of your process, is what worked for your company six months ago no longer works today. So you can say, this work has definitely hit every note of what I think should happen, but it's not working. So we need to find a new process to move into and to then hope that that lifts the quality of the outcome. Uh, it can also be that the comfort word I chose is for um, kind of cargo cult culting process, which is that you know, you're following all these steps that have no meaningful connection to outcome, which is where you get a bonus rant of something I really, really hate, which is overzealous linting of code, uh, code changes. I've seen, I don't know how many times in my life, uh, appease Rubocop or please JS Lint or any other local variety of stuff. And the reason why they drive me nuts is they often slow down velocity. Then the natural response is, well, the developer should be running them in their editor. And my response is, well, does it matter? Does any meaningful metric of quality for your system hinge upon whether there are single quotes or double quotes on your string. I, I've seen tech debt accumulate because con domains are not mapped out adequately or that um, there's a mishmash of functional style and object style. Um, but these are things that are not textually easy to find. And that's when you kind of come to the point where you go, well, actually, it was there because two developers were arguing and we wanted to stop the argument by just picking a rule and, and then making it executable. And to me, that is such a frustrating answer because as a manager, you want to be fostering autonomy and devolving decision-making power. And when I hear an argument like that, I hear, I don't have the emotional regulation as an adult to not argue about something that doesn't matter in the course of my work. And so are they going to apply that same rigor to product decisions or to um, more meaningful technical issues? It really gets my goat. But we're done. Now we can talk about gold, which is when everything's working well. Um, don't do anything. It's working. <laughs> Just leave it alone. Um, it might be within your org that one team hits the sweet spot. And this is where I think you need to start signal boosting um, the work that they're doing to the other teams, to let, you know, let them be an example discover the teams, that are, teams and individuals doing the best work and hold them up as an example. This is the kind of harmonizing of incentives I was talking about, which is you go find great work and you, you magnify it within your group. Um, oh, it's just such a good out country kind of vibe. Um, you should listen to all of these albums when you get home tonight. <laughs> so, there's, I think, a lot more to explore in this topic, um, but hopefully, at least, I laid out a reasonable enough case that you should, every day, gather your thoughts 
go to where the work is, keep some kind of record of those thoughts, um, apply nudges if the team needs it, and keep your mouth shut if they don't. Um, that's the sum of my rant. Um, you can visit my website or the BIRD website. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>